my name is Yulia Kriskovitz, and I'm with the communications team of the um, Feldenkrais Guild of North America. And I'm excited to welcome Joshua Walk, um, a guild certified Feldenkrais practitioner and a long term Aikido practitioner as well. He's also a co director of the New England Awareness Through Movement training program. Uh, welcome, Joshua. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, I was really excited um, to interview you because I know you started uh, practicing Aikido before you started doing Feldenkrais so, and have done it for many years. So I wanted to learn more about how you came to practice martial arts. Yeah, well, uh, I started very young. So my, my parents were both involved in martial arts and my mother in particular became, um, later became a, a martial arts teacher. She became an Aikido teacher uh, when I was a teenager. Um, and my father was very involved with Zen Buddhism. And so from about the age of seven, I started practicing Aikido. And um, my first teacher was a, uh, also a woman. Her name was Musko Menegishi. And she was at the time, I think, maybe a second or third degree black belt. And she was, uh, I was especially in love with her as an Aikido teacher because she was about my same size. She was very, very, very small. And um, she could do amazing things with her size. She was very strong, um, but... Her ability belied her strength. So I was, I just thought it was wonderful that she could, she could sort of take big guys and throw them around the mat at, as a little tiny person. And I mean, I was a little tiny person too. So that was especially, uh, especially interesting. Hmm. So in addition to being strong and throwing big guys uh, down to the mat. Uh, were there any other benefits of <laughs> doing Aikido as a young person? I mean, when I was a kid, I, you know, I think my relationship with her was a tremendous benefit. She was an incredibly interesting person. Um, she had a lot of interesting connections. So through her, I met, um, you know, I, I was, as a little boy, I was sitting around the dinner table with um, Iaido masters. I, Iaido is a martial art of, a, it's an art of, of just drawing and and cutting with the, it's a solo practice, drawing and cutting with the katana, the samurai sword. And um, so there would be Iaido masters and Aikido masters and Zen masters and just all these, these people were just sort of characters of my childhood. And um, it was just a very rich environment. And I, I was, you know, I was very, um, I think my, my, my deep passion as a little, boy was people who could do things that were sort of amazing you know whatever it was I wasn't particularly interested in fighting to tell you the truth I was more just interested in what I've always sort of thought of as kind of the the semi-magical abilities that some people seem to seem to develop over a lifetime of training or in one way or another and um so I think it was I think it was being introduced to so many interesting people as a little boy, that was really, you know, such a, such a big benefit. And they just introduced to the idea that uh, our limitations are not necessarily what we think they are. Hmm. And how did um, Feldenkrais come into the picture? Well, uh, so let's see, I was I, at, at, 17, I had just graduated from high school, and rather than going to college, I was interested in training with a, with a true master. And there was a master of Aikido who was um, Mutsuko's, Mutsuko's hero, was a, a master by the name of TK Chiba. And I had been hearing about him since I was a little boy, and I had seen him a few times. And there were some other masters that I was aware of and interested in, uh, in Aikido specifically. And uh, I ended up going to California to train with this particular master, uh, TK Chiba, who was, I spent several years um, 
with him, a very intense sort of relationship. And it just so happens that he was also the teacher of a person named Elizabeth Berenger, who um, is my first connection. Actually, not really my first connection. There's a funny story there. She was, she was my first conscious connection with the Feldenkrais method. And she introduced me to the method. Um, I met her through Aikido. And um, she started telling me about this amazing Israeli physicist, martial artist who did this method, the Feldenkrais method, and um, how how uh, I you know I, I sort of fell in love with him as a as a as a person. You know, I, I got so that I was very taken with him uh, through Elizabeth, through my exposure to him through Elizabeth. Uh, he had already passed away, unfortunately. But um, I was really, really, really intrigued. And so on her advice, I started, I started taking some functional integration lessons and doing awareness through movement. And pretty soon I was in a training program. I think I was, I think I was 21 when I started the training. So I had been training with my Aikido master by that time for three or four years. Wow. And um, but then it's a very strange thing, you know, when I, this is just a sort of a funny coincidental story. When I was a little boy, I was at a big Aikido seminar that happens on the East Coast every year. It's called the Aikido Summer Camp. People come from all over the world and they, you know, it's hundreds of people and they train. In those days, it wasn't so many people, maybe 200 people back then. There weren't so many people doing Aikido yet. And um, after the Aikido, there was a week of Aikido training. And then during the Aikido, there were these people who were, it was at, held at a place called Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And there were these people who would be out on the lawn, not wearing very much clothing and doing all kinds of weird movements. And I remember asking people, who are these people? What are they doing? What, and I was really, and someone told me, someone, someone explained to me, they said, there's this old man and he's a scientist and he's teaching them about efficient movement and i was i was 10 years old and i i was i was incredibly intrigued and i remember thinking at that time i want to know about that that's something i'm interested in i should know about that and then when i met elizabeth later you know eight years later nine years later um i had forgotten about it and of course, it turns out that this Moshe Feldenkrais, I had seen his students sort of out on the lawn doing, doing Feldenkrais movements and wondering what it was. And it, but it took me, I was, I think I was three years into my training before I, people kept talking about the Amherst training program. And it took me a long time to piece it together that that was something I had already seen. What so it was a funny, funny coincidence. Yeah. Wow. And um, so how did, you know, once you started doing Feldenkrais method seriously, uh, did you notice any changes in your Aikido? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's kind of a funny story. So um, when I was a little kid, I had several, uh, two in particular, quite severe bicycle accident. And I had some damage to my spine and I had some other, I had some, by the time I was 20 and training in Aikido, you know, I was training like five hours a day or many, many hours. This is a very intensive apprenticeship that I did with my master. And I had a lot of pain. So I started doing, I, I was interested in Feldenkrais for other reasons, but I was also interested because I wanted my back to feel better. Mm. And I had quite severe knee injury. And when I first started doing Feldenkrais, um, I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, I was intrigued because I knew about Feldenkrais the man, but I, I didn't find the method, to, I, I wasn't someone who immediately saw it as a valuable and amazing thing. In fact, I thought it was um, a little, a little woo woo. It was like a little, uh, you know, very gentle. And I just felt like this, this can't really be doing anything. But after not very long, um, I started to notice that on the mat, not only was my pain better, but something quite dramatic was changing in my Aikido. And when I started doing Feldenkrais fairly intensively, 
um, the change was was very dramatic. And my my Aikido master, part of the reason why Mutsuko loved him so much and was so respectful of him was because he was the hardest and the harshest and the strongest and the most traditional. And he just he was like training with him was incredibly uh, taxing in many many ways. Um, and she just thought that was how it was, that's how it should be. It's a very sort of Japanese attitude. Um, and uh, he was always very disappointed with his students. So, and he wasn't just disappointed with his students because he was a cranky man, although he was a fairly cranky man much of the time. He really felt that there was something fundamentally different about the way Westerners moved. He just felt, he just, he just, he very frequently was like, I can't, I can't, he would, he would sort of throw up his arms in frustration with this idea of like, I, this very, very subtle art. I'm, he was just, he really struggled to try to transmit it to, um, well, to anybody. He wasn't particularly impressed with most of his Japanese students either, but he very, he very much felt that um, there was something about the way Westerners move. There's, there's just a difference in the way we move our bodies that he felt was a very difficult challenge to overcome in terms of learning Aikido or any martial art. And he, he was very, very, very frustrated. Hmm. And um, not that long into my Feldenkrais training program, something very interesting started to happen, which is that he would, he would say something like, move from your pelvis, use, use your spine, not your arms, right? Or he, he would say, move from the hips, you know, he would, and he would sort of, he would say these things with this tremendous frustration. And, um, and we would try our hardest, you know, we would try, we would try, and, and believe me, this, this was a great master, and he had many, many great students. And I mean, the dojo had the, the hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor for the FBI, the local FBI, uh, and the head of the FBI SWAT team. And, there, and it was in San Diego, so there were, there were always two or three Navy SEALs in the dojo. Very, very capable uh, martial artists. Many, many very capable martial artists. And, but my master was always just, you know, he was just very disappointed. Mm. Some of these guys were like real killers. Like they could kill you, but they couldn't do Aikido with the subtlety and the, and the grace and the, and the, really the, the true, the, the, the gentle and subtle aspects of the art as well as the, the more dynamic aspects. So did you notice that perhaps this differentiation that we learn in Feldenkrais was helpful in achieving this subtle way of moving? I mean, differentiation, integration, just, it just got so that when he would say, do it from your pelvis, I understood what he meant. I could, I very clearly had a transformation where I could, I, I, and I wasn't the only one who noticed it. Uh, he came to me, he said, what's, you know, what's going on? And, um, he said, you, you know, he, there was a, a fairly long period of time where he stopped demonstrating. He would demonstrate a technique and he would watch the class and then he would say, ah, and he said, Josh, you do. And he said, he's American and he can do it. So you do it. Just mm. watch him do it. And he would, he made me demonstrate the technique many, many times uh, for his classes that he was teaching. And it was a very difficult position for me to be in because there were a lot of people who were quite senior to me in the school who, uh, you know, rank wise, they were senior to me. They'd been there for longer. And um, I was only 23 years old and 22, 23 years old. It was, it, I, I felt a tremendous amount of pressure as a result of that. And it was, I, I can't say that I handled that particularly well. Um, but it was quite an amazing experience to have this art, this method, the Feldenkrais method have such a dramatic effect. It was, it wasn't just, oh, I feel a little stronger or it was just, it was like night and day. It really, really was. And I, I mean, I was capable before I was, I was, you know, I was training at a great dojo and I was an apprentice to a great master and I was already by the sort of typical standards quite good. But I knew I wasn't, I knew I wasn't really doing it the way he was doing it. I knew that for sure. 
And Feldenkrais really allowed me to feel like I was doing much something at least much closer, much more. And it was absolutely doing Feldenkrais method that helped with that transformation. It was not my own magical genius or anything. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't get that kind of credit, but Feldenkrais gets the credit. Yeah, it, I, I'm also curious that you you coming into learning Feldenkrais method with this background of Aikido work and partner work, if that yeah. was also a big advantage, um, you know, knowing from myself when I, I you know, I, I've done some martial art, but I also have done uh, tango, which is, you know, very part of oh. like, focus on connection. Partner. Yeah. So when I started learning, working in functional integration with people it was very helpful. So I wonder if um, Aikido work was helpful to you. Oh, I think it, yes, Aikido was very helpful. Um, maybe not, maybe not immediately. I didn't necessarily feel immediately in my training program that I had some kind of tremendous advantage uh, in learning the method. I, I think like many people, I, I found it difficult to learn to do functional integration and to touch other people in a way that was useful. But I think the fact that functional integration relies so much on communication, it's the touch is primarily a communicative touch and not, not a healing touch or a massaging touch or a, as, as you know. And um, because it's communicative, having the ability to touch in a clear way, in, in a certain way to say, with a clear voice, something. And to be able to feel, to, you know, in martial arts, of course, you have to be very sensitive, particularly, I think, in an art like judo that Feldenkrais practiced, you're being very, very sensitive to what your partner is doing all the time. And Aikido has a, a large amount of that same quality. So being able to use your hands to feel what's happening for another person is um, over the years I have discovered that it, that was, I think that my early foundation in that was very helpful. Um, and being able to communicate clearly and to handle another person clearly and confidently. Uh, you certainly learn that by doing Aikido and Judo. I'm not sure you learn it by doing um, any, any martial art, but some martial arts have that as an element. And I think tango has a very, I think, you know, I've only done a little tango, but I think it has a very similar, um, a very similar thing. But also in terms of understanding function, understanding the way that, that the human structure uh, functions and the way that people learn, uh, I think those are also things that are very much helped by doing martial arts. And in particular, something like Judo or Aikido, uh, an art where you really, you're really handling the other person in, in uh, many, many, many different ways, you know sort of twist the arm in any direction that it can. There's a technique for every direction that the arm can move. There's a technique for that. There's a, a joint lock or a, some other kind of way to move the whole person from one, from one part, which of course is very familiar to any Feldenkrais person. Um, the thing I think that's particularly great about martial arts and something like Aikido or Judo in particular is that the movement, unlike something like dance or gymnastics or, or those kinds of things, the movement is entirely dictated by what works. It's entirely functional. And of course, you could say something similar about certain dance forms that there's a, it, has to, it has to work. It doesn't, it's not just about looking good, but there's no, there's really kind of no aesthetic aspect to martial arts. It's just function and of course, very functional movement ends up being beautiful frequently, but it's really centered around what is the most functional and easiest way of doing a particular thing, which of course that has so much crossover uh, with, with Feldenkrais. And I think, I think in, a in a special way, other than different from other sort of athletic endeavors or movement endeavors, that focus on functionality, what, what really works and what works with the least effort so yeah, that you can do it, you can do it yeah. the quickest. Yeah. And we, you know, we all know that 
Judah was kind of the source of Feldenkrais in a way for, for Moshe. So that, at least that's one of the versions I've heard um, that functionally- Certainly one source, certainly one big, one big source. Their survival, the ultimate survival. Um, yeah. Um, I'm curious actually, do you still practice Aikido? Oh yeah, almost pretty much daily. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And, and do you think you will continue into your senior years? Because I know some people do quit uh, because of the physical challenges. Um, and I wonder well, if Helen Christ can support that actually. I think, I think, I mean, I have to say, you know, I look around at other people my age, I'm 51. Right. So, and I look at other people who've been doing Aikido since they were young, who are 51, and you see a lot of broken parts. You see a lot of wrists that hurt and shoulders and necks and backs and knees that don't work anymore and all kinds of abuse that the body can really take from doing those things. Um, and I think that as a result of doing Feldenkrais right along with my martial arts training, uh, in fact, I've gotten so that I have fewer, I was, I was in pretty rough shape when I was 23, 24, 25, I had quite bad knees and, uh, you know, orthopedists were telling me that I needed surgery or I wouldn't, I would really be messed up. My back, I had very serious diagnoses in of various kinds, and degenerative disc and stenosis and bulging discs and all kinds of things in my lumbar spine. And I, I'm, I'm more flexible and better with all of those things now at 51 than I was at 25, much better. Um, and I can't attribute that to anything other than doing Feldenkrais a lot, you know? <laughs> so. you're, you're the poster boy of Feldenkrais method. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, we, all have our, we all have our issues and we all have our things, but I, I uh, yeah, I, I have only gotten more flexible over the years mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'm, it's, it doesn't age proof you entirely, but um, it makes a very, very, very big difference. It, only, it allows you to continue to do these things into, you know, of course you, ha you have to change how you train. You can't train the way a 25 year old trains, you, but you, you can still do, uh, one can still do a great deal. Uh, and part of what you learn in doing Feldenkrais and by watching older people who do martial arts well, is you learn to really take care of yourself. You learn how to protect yourself in a way that a young person doesn't know. So you can, you can get away with more in a mm -hmm. certain way. Well, yeah. it's interesting you mentioned being flexible and there's this famous quote of Moshe Feldenkrais that he's after flexible minds and not flexible bodies. Yeah. Did you also notice that your mind is more flexible, less rigid? I like to think so. You know, I think, um, of course, you, you, you never know what it would have been like otherwise. You only know, you only know how you are. Um, it's funny, I was just telling a client a story about my son is at an age where he's interested in video games. And when I was a kid, video games were um, one, a joystick and a button. And that was it, that was as, as, and now you have these controllers and there's a trigger and there's another, tri there's two triggers for each, there, you have one for each of these fingers and you're moving a joystick with each thumb. And then there's four buttons for each finger. It's an, it's an incredible amount of, of little devices that you have to manipulate. And I, in my late twenties, I spent some time actually with my, my primary Feldenkrais mentor's sons. Uh, so my primary mentor was Mark Reese and he had two sons who I was very fond of and spent a lot of time with. And they tried to teach me to play video games when I was in my twenties. And I had only ever done the one joystick and the button. I couldn't learn it for the life of me. I really, it was like, uh, and I spent, I really worked at it. I spent three days trying to learn to do it. And I couldn't, you know, I don't know if you know anything about these things, but you're moving around in a three-dimensional world and you have to be able to turn, you have to be able to move your, your vision one way while, while you're moving your actual, your virtual body around in another way. It's very complicated and all these buttons. 
and I, you know, they were coaching me and helping me three days and I couldn't, I couldn't learn it for the life of me. But 15 years later, I, my own son was at an age where he wanted me to play video games with him. And we, he gets to spend a little time playing video games and I get to spend a little time playing. And lo and behold, I don't know if my brain was working on it for 15 years in the background, but it quite quickly, quite quickly, I was able to learn how, I mean, he's much better than I am, but I can do it. I can actually, I can remember which buttons and I can move them and I can do all the navigating. It's incredibly complicated what those kids do with those things. But I found that I was, my, I was able to learn this new thing at a fairly advanced age. This was only three, four, this was only three, four years ago. That's not that advanced. <laughs> But <laughs> so I think I, you know, that's just one story. I do think that um, it does keep you flexible in that way. And Feldenkrais said, I'm after flexible, flexible, fle flexible brains, not flexible oh, bodies. Right. Yeah. But he also said, uh, I have from my, my Feldenkrais mentor, he also said that he became more flexible as he got older, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of. What we what we generally think of as flexibility, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the ability to lengthen the muscles easily. Without and, um, just a disclaimer for people who are watching, without stretching. <laughs> without stretching, exactly. Without stretching. So um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. It has been really an insightful conversation um, for me, and I'm sure for those who are watching. Um, yeah, sure. Do you have any final words or anything you want to share? Um, uh, I mean, you know, I could I could talk about this subject for hours, um, and I won't I won't put you through that. But um, you know, one thing I think is very important for people who do Feldenkrais already, who are interested in martial arts. One thing that's incredibly important to know. Well, I actually have a few things on that subject if we have a little while. Do you have can you take a few more minutes? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. One thing is that, you know, people spend a lot of time focusing on which art should I practice? Should I practice Aikido? Should I practice Judo? Should I practice Kung Fu? Should I practice whatever? Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which I also spent some time with when I was young enough to think that that was important. Um, and I think that the first thing I would tell people is find a teacher that you like and an atmosphere in the dojo or in the school that you feel is welcoming and comfortable and where you feel where you feel you can say no. Mm. If someone says, now we're doing this, you say, no, no, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, not everybody's 20 years old and wants to do crazy things. So that's much more important. Finding a good teacher who allows that. Kind of atmosphere is much more important than um, which art you practice. And, you know, it's, we have this idea, I think many people in the Feldenkrais world have this idea that, you know, there's some one magical way of moving that martial artists know. But the fact is every art, the, the great proponents and great, um, uh, the people who are very capable in one art move very differently from people who are very capable in another art. So for instance, a karate, a karate master will move very, very differently from a judo master or from an Aikido master. And um, it's not all the same. A tai Chi requires a, a very different kind of organization from Aikido. And, and some people might say, oh, well, but they all head in the same direction. And actually, I just don't think that's true. Uh, so the art that you choose is important, but the teacher is much more important. And if you can find a teacher who also does Feldenkrais, then you're really in good shape. Uh, I had there's other things, but I think maybe maybe we'll leave it there. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. It was a pleasure.